that original business was specifically just Etsy. And I learned the Etsy SEO and the Etsy advertising and shit really well. We did like 5K in sales in a month on that, but we ran out of inventory. So, okay. This yeah. is like my Google now. Like, this is my time to learn Google. You know, I've been just starting up random little stuff, just random stores just to play around as long as I like don't go negative. I don't really care just to learn. And now that I've learned enough, now I'm utilizing it. Exactly. Like, at some point, it's going to be profitable. Just, you know, you got to put the, I don't know, I guess it's just so many angles to get, go from. Because mm -hmm. you can use the Facebook ads, you can use Pinterest ads, you can use influencer marketing. Have you ever but, fucked around with Pinterest ads? I have, and it's very profitable. But you got you? You to have the right niche. So I was going to say, I played around with like in the jewelry niche yeah. and uh, I was getting extremely treat traffic but i feel like a lot of the people that were their bounce rate was like less than a second on most of the traffic which yeah. i read up and a lot of people say that a lot of people like they'll click on accident the way that it's set up, it's set up yep. and you uh, i mean I, I was getting clicks as cheap as like 10 cents but none of them converted so i stopped using it yeah so that's the thing like most of these traffic sources are going to have different types of traffic like the quality yeah so facebook is really where you're gonna see high click through. So, so a lot of people on Facebook click, but even more people on Google click because they're searching for the actual product. Well, yeah, it's hot then, traffic, right? Yeah, but then on Pinterest, it's more so a lot of it is actually junk traffic and a lot of it is actually bots too. That's what I thought. That's what I was thinking is it looked like it was some sketchy shit going on on the Pinterest exactly. side and I just stopped. I was like, I ain't wasting my money on this. Exactly, <laughs> but, but it is profitable because even with the, the junk traffic on top of the actual traffic, when you get the right traffic, you know, it's still good. It's still, it's yeah. still like I, I was getting a, a four point, I was getting like a 4.3 ROA on Pinterest. Nice. The same product that I was advertising on Facebook that was getting like a 3.7. Mm -hmm. so it was still, you know, just because the quality of traffic is different doesn't mean that it's like a, a game changer, but it also depends on the niche, like jewelry, home decor, shit like that. That works well on Pinterest because that's just where the audience is. Yeah, like, exactly. Right. That's a nice like view. Fitness, if people are searching for it, then you want to you want to be on Google. So it really depends what your product is. That's why when everybody you know asks, "Yo, what what is does this work? Does this not work?" It depends on your product and the angle you're coming from, really. Yeah, and that's what like I I'm in like the Charlie Brent facebook group and a lot of people ask really dumb ass questions on there and um one thing i always like say to people is like realistically speaking like picking like all advertising sources are good it's just a matter of picking the right one for your product like from my personal experience i find that very practical products don't do the best on facebook they do better on google just because there's already right. a scene there there's already people searching for it but if you're selling something completely new that nobody's searching for on google then you need to put that in front of people to educate them on the product right yep and also create the social proof to make it look like or not even to make it look like but to see people's actual feedback real time and then yep. if other people see that it doesn't matter whether they know the product or not they're willing to give it a try type thing exactly right you put it in front of somebody and teach them what it is and they'll be like oh shit like how did i not know this existed you know right Right. So um, with that being said, what's, you know, I know you guys are doing like, a, from my standpoint, Dylan, you kind of like the mastery behind the ads and the actual deployment and all of that. Mastermind. And, and um, John <laughs> is kind of <laughs> you know, the brainstorm of the ideas and kind of the angle and the, the education of the product. So like, um, what I wanted to, to know was, what's your biggest bottlenecks right now? What what things are, are kind of holding you back from achieving whatever goal? And what is that goal? Shopify? <laughs> <laughs> no, like right now we're bottlenecked mainly on, um, like I have like a, when I do e-commerce stuff, I have a very oh, like shit. practical plan set out with different phases. And then I don't want to like bite off too much. You know what I mean? I like to chew my food and I like to swallow it and then move on to the next bite. Right. So I have a whole bunch of phases set out. So we actually, we were talking to John yesterday um, and I told him that we're starting phase two now. So phase one was just all about setting it up, testing it, make sure there's a market, make sure that our ads are 
obviously like you can have a winning product, but your ads could be too much and it doesn't work. Right. So um, getting all of that stuff, setting up the storefront, getting it all going, making sure it's there. Now we're moving into phase two, which is all about margins, which ordering product is currently the bottleneck that we're at just because um, I know the law in Canada for importation of product and LLCs and all that stuff. But when it comes to the States, I've never dealt with it because I don't live there. Right. So right now I'm really trying to learn up on how LLCs work in the States and tax law with importation and all that kind of stuff, because you guys aren't like Canada. Whereas in Canada, everything has a fixed tax. But from what I've learned is that every state has its own percentage, right? Yeah. So that's interesting. (laughs) So that's the different thing is, each state, you would have to educate yourself on the state. So where, what state are y'all planning to register the business in the U.S., in Georgia? Well, that's the thing I was actually hoping to ask you because I've read online a bunch of people saying, register here, register there. And then I've also read people saying, just register where you live. At the end of the day, it just it's more of a headache registering somewhere where you yeah. don't reside. So I don't really personally know because we're looking at doing the LLC this week. That way, when we order bulk, we don't get double charged on the taxing, right? Got you. So um, from my suggestion, I would keep it, especially since you're right now, you're going through a stage where Shopify is asking for a lot of legitimacy. They want to make sure mm-hmm. things add up. And they do this at the perfect time so that they can make sure whatever papers you get and whatever things you do um, register from now on is going to match up with what you got going on. Right. So you want to stay consistent. You don't want them... Um, causing any problems blocking your money you're like long term in the future because things don't add up so for that reason i would say uh, register it in georgia since john is based there you know or john you actually have a alabama. you actually have a, a, a alabama address right mm-hmm. that'll probably be cheaper that's what that'll i was thinking cheaper as far as taxes you feel me so um if you was living in new york where the tax rate is like crazy high i'd be like yo Fine, we can get a loophole. We can or try to do something to where you could get a, a offshore account in Singapore and not pay any taxes at all. Mm-hmm. But then the papers you, you're gonna need the papers to match up, right? It's gonna take right. a lot. You can do that later on in the stage. For right now, I would suggest registering it in Alabama because that's gonna be the cheapest um, tax code. Let me just search it real quick. Yeah, I know here it's 13%, so I would hey, never want to Mo. register it here. <laughs> yeah. Mo. yeah, what's up, bro? You're looking skinny. Just want to let you know that. <laughs> yeah, bro. Yeah. I'm, st- Bro, trust me. But yeah, fucking do Alabama. It's 4% right now. That's sales tax, but it's do Alabama. And then later on down the line, you can always switch to um singapore or you know if you want to get an offshore account completely save on taxes there's a guy i could connect you with he'll pay him like three he charges like three thousand dollars he'll set up he'll go to the thing for you he'll go to like the bank for you register it all in in your name and he'll just be the sponsor and then you have the account everything is good but um do that you can also don't go through a lawyer or anything use um, what you call it, legal zoom. If you're gonna be doing uh, business things in the U.S. or anything like that, use legal zoom, and they'll handle all the papers for you. You can do it express if Shopify is asking you for like expedited shipping. Mm-hmm. You can do it express, and they'll sh- um, send it to you within like ten days or something. Okay, so you can have that pretty quick. Okay. And now when we register the LLC, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer this question, but I just figure you probably have the best chance for me. Um, So obviously it's a dual partnership, um, but I'm also in Canada, right? And the borders are closed. I can't go over there to sign any kind of paperwork or anything like that if that is required. I know some things in the United States, from my understanding, still use paper and pen and mail, whereas Uh everything in Canada is scanned. Um, Yeah. So if I have to sign anything by paper and the border's closed, is it easier to just register the entire LLC in John's name for tax purposes? Um, yeah. See, you can register it in John's name and then come up, come up with a, a, a separate contract, right? That's just between you and John. 
and yeah. then you sign that just for your own protection, you know, right? Yeah. Yeah, peace of mind or protection or whatever. But okay. you know, it depends if you want to present it to the government as a partnership or if you want to just run the business and then in between yourselves, you know, just run it as a partnership. Yeah, and that's that's what I was thinking is that realistically speaking, if it's going to be more of a pain than it's worth, especially as a Canadian yeah. citizen, having a US LLC is kind of a pain. Um, from what I've looked at, it's probably easier for him to just do that. And then I can register an LLC in Canada when we expand into the Canadian market, just have the LLC here in my name. Right. But, um, I would do that. I would do that just because I also have no experience doing partnerships. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there would be paperwork where your signature is required and stuff like that. So gotcha. that would be my angle. Yeah. Now, um, when you import mass product we're talking um from what i understand with the u.s tax law anything over 2500 u.s is subject to um duty clearance yeah um but if they suspect that it's for resale you'll get hit with that duty clearance even if it is under 2500 u.s correct um yes and so this is a gray area because each article of clothing also has its own like um what you call that i forgot the harmonized I, tax code right yeah the, the tax code and whatnot but um for your product which is is mostly in fitness you would have to i don't want to put any you know yeah no take it with a grain of salt yeah take it with a grain of salt but you're gonna have to um definitely get like a free consultation from a lawyer or something right okay they're more um knowledgeable on this and you can just shoot them that question you probably won't have to pay it would just be a free consultation if you want to work with them further. So they manage the whole transaction and stuff mm -hmm. and you can um, pay the service fees or whatever, but you can usually get the answer from an actual professional um, just as a free quote, you know, as right. a courtesy. And as far as taxes, usually um, they're not going to detect that it's for resale. You yeah. know, if you, if you tell the, the person you're getting it from, you know, just mark it as, a, um, you know, a, a personal address. Now, on their side, they might have to put some papers or documents that's going to actually show it. But if it does get held up at customs, then they're going to hit you with it. They're going to yeah. hit you with that extra tax. So I would just have extra funds. Don't spend all the funds on the product itself. I'll leave some wiggle room for, like, shipping costs and things like tax, too. Gotcha. How much is tax, uh, like the duty import? Do you know the percentage by chance? Um, it's no more than 8%. Okay, so it's not brutal. Okay, yeah, yeah and Canada it can go up to 49%. Yeah, I know. You, I heard about Canada, and same thing in like They're London, brutal. too. The taxes is crazy. Yeah, I mean, like literally clothes, even if I go to the States and buy clothes and come back because I live on the border, um, like even just brands. Like I remember there was one time we went to True Religion and we got charged 29% on each item. Wow. Yeah. So like I know in Canada, you don't screw around with the tax law. You want to make sure that that's good. But I mean, if it's only 8% in the States, like our margins are good enough to support that. So it's not that big of a deal. Good. As long as it just doesn't get held up. That's my main concern is if it gets held at customs, especially right now with the pandemic, yeah. everything's delayed. That's the last thing we need. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, now what kind of lawyer should I contact? Would that be a tax lawyer or a business lawyer? Um, get an international business lawyer. International business lawyer. Yeah. Okay. And usually you could just go business, but if you want to be more uh, specific, uh, international business would work. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. That is good to know because that is obviously, I'm assuming we would want to register the LLC before we order the bulk just to make sure we're covered. Yeah. Right. And we're yeah. looking to do that this week. So hopefully can get that done. That's one of the big things that I, I feel like you don't really know about until you get to that situation right and yeah i don't want to make any mistakes that cost me a lot of money you know <laughs> no you're right and you don't have to wait for the papers to come in so as soon as you file the loc today you can you know start the, the process on your orders because it's going to take them time to build that order too you have yeah. to think about your um the lead time and the shipping yeah time you have to freight. think about the lead time too so that's one of the biggest things that i fell into when i was going through um when I was dealing with uh, like buying and, and, and stocking products in house mm -hmm. and sending them to a third party fulfillment. But from what I understand, y'all shipping these out from your home starting up. Correct. 
all right, yeah, that would be the best idea to start off because it's going to save you money. It's going to give you um, a better understanding of your business and how, you know, each product is being shipped, how, you know, people are going to actually receive the final product. And Correct. then, you, you know, it does a lot for you to, as the business owner. So, you know, you, it gives you more direction in the future. Like, all right, this is what I want. This is how we want our customers to see our package and our brand and stuff like that. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, when I used to do the jewelry side way back a couple of years, um, I know that every time I'd process 10, 20 orders, I'd have a new idea and go to my partner and be like, yo, we need to, we need to do this for the packaging. It's only going to cost an extra dollar, but it's going to make it look so much better and stuff like that. And I know we made probably four or five adjustments within two months uh, with the packaging that we would have never known if we weren't personally handling it. Right. Word. Word. Yeah. So it's a lot of things like that, man. Um, but what else as far like I'm that's pretty much like logistic stuff, right? But like mm -hmm. let's say let's talk about conversions and what's actually going on on the storefront, how people react to your ads and stuff. Uh mostly positive actually. We've um uh, we've really um one thing that I like to take pride in is that I'm very good at breaking down data. One thing that I started out right away um is the importance of Google Analytics and being able to set up your funnels correctly to track and seeing where the bottlenecks are. Um, another big thing that we did, um, which I do with all of my stores when I launch them, is once I start running ads and I'm starting to see a decent amount of traffic coming in, I use um, an application on Shopify called Lucky Orange. Yeah. And it for people that don't know what that is, realistically speaking, what it does is it actually screen records Yep. Um, everyone that comes into your site and what they react on and things like that. And we really use that information to see at what point we would drop customers and what point people would get stuck. Um, I know on one of my previous websites, um, I use custom themes that I make. Um, yep. And there was little tiny gray arrows in the corner to shift pictures. Uh, apparently a lot of people couldn't figure that out and they couldn't figure out how to move pictures and they'd get frustrated and leave. Mm -hmm on that website specifically changing the pictures to not have that little gray arrow and just autoplay every two seconds and shift right. boosted the conversion rate over 5%, See? something that you would never think, never think is a problem, right? So tools like that, especially when you're first launching, I noticed were very good. So we've used stuff like that. Um, we've, I really like using urgency on the website, but not the traditional drop shipping types of urgency such as uh, like the spammy timers and stuff like that and deal promotions buy two kind of idea I'm not really into that because I like to make my websites look as professional as possible and not like a startup right I like to make my goal for my website and it's what I tell John all the time and other people um, the goal of making a website is not to convince the customer that you're a real company. The goal is to make your customer think, damn, how did I not know these guys existed? You want to make them feel like they're the ones that are missing out and we're not new. Right. Yes. Yes. Which is what I strive to do. So our conversion rate right now, um, most days on average, we're averaging between a uh, 10 and 13% conversion rate, yeah. um, on extremely cheap, extremely cheap, uh, shopping traffic right now. So, the mix between the two, even though we're drop shipping and our shipping is $30 right now because of the pandemic, uh, we're averaging six day delivery time from China, but we're paying $30 for that shipping. Our margins are still uh, over 30%. So, Yeah, what that does for you long term is actually worth the, the paying the extra in shipping. You know, I see a lot of people that try to like, they're so stuck up on the, the, the now margins and the margins that they're getting right now that they're not seeing the long-term vision of the store. It's like, I'd rather, I'd rather make 100K consistently per month mm -hmm. right, with less margins than to do two, three months of just scaling the store crazy, but then you have unhappy customers that didn't even get their products in the three months. Correct, so, and they're getting good, held up too, right? Yeah. So that's a good trade-off. And I like what you said about, um, you know, the, you know, as starting off the most underrated app, I tell all my students this too, is Lucky Orange. A lot of times they're like, all right, I'm getting visitors right now, but I'm not getting any sales. What do I do? There's principles. And of course there's things you should follow. Like you should have the urgency, but again, it shouldn't be some wacky tacky urgency that every other drop should be users. Right. You can have those core principles that sell, 
But the most simplest way to just diagnose your store and see if it's working or not is just go and get that app and that plugin and see firsthand what people are doing. It's like, it's a, it's a cheat code. Yep. You know? it's a oh, cheat yeah. Code. You're literally looking inside of the customer's experience and mind. And obviously, anyone who designs a Shopify store is going to be in love with their own creation, right? So you're not, you're only getting one perspective of that spectrum though, right? right? Because you might be a customer that would buy from your own website. But the thing is, is there's a lot of different kinds of customer mindsets. And if you don't have a tool like that to see how they're reacting on your page, you might be appealing to one set of customers, but missing out on four other types, right? Yeah. Being able to utilize that data and see what people like and what people don't like and trying to find that middle ground to appeal to everybody is very like really important for your conversion rate. And once you hit it, you know, you hit it. Right. Yeah, exactly. No, you got it like spot on. And I like the, basically what you've said in the past, I'd say five minutes, I can see why you've had the success you've had. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate because that. You're not taking that. You're not, the approach is different. It's different. It's, it's different from other drop shipping stores, but, um, just, I want to, just for the audience and everybody watching right now, I want to know kind of your, your background and how you, the story behind how you actually got started, because you told me a little bit earlier, you was into um, working online, like with Etsy and, and all of that before, but then you got into the drop shipping. What made you make that shift or what inspired you to um, go all in with the drop shipping? So um, it's actually not your traditional story of, I just want to make some money on the internet. Um, traditionally, I started a business uh, with a partner that eventually ended up dissolving over long term. Yeah. Um, but the thing about that business is everything was custom made. So we had to order with Alibaba. We had manufacturers. I had a list of well, damn near 15 manufacturers and trying to get the best price on every individual product to have it custom made. It was in the jewelry niche. So anyone um, that knows anything about the jewelry niche will know that there is a very, very wide variety of material and plating and stones and everything, right? So if you want a product that you believe in, you really have to break it down, customize it, order quantity and get it in, right? One of the main problems that we had is that um, any anyone starting a business, your first priority is traffic and sales, right? You really want to see something happen on it. The problem is, is that we actually, by the time we figured it out, um, mainly mostly was me doing SEO and product pages and stuff. It was all on Etsy. By the time I figured out the Etsy algorithm, um, I actually was doing so many little things that when one finally clicked, they all clicked mm. and we started getting too many sales, which is a good problem to have, which is the problem that we actually have with our current store right now is too much volume. Um, but back then we were ordering product from overseas so we had lead time we had shipping time and stuff thankfully we would uh we had a pretty good supplier with a good relationship with dhl so we were getting shipments of bulk product we're say 50 to 100 units because jewelry is small uh we would only pay about 150 200 in dhl so it was super quick um our manufacturers are uh the volume would make it go a little bit quicker for us but we still were running into issues where we were selling too much and getting that product in is uh, anyone who's ever experienced that it is extremely stressful because you, you realize that you're sitting on a pot of gold. Yeah. But yeah. You, you can't grab the gold because you got these gloves on and you're sitting there trying and you can't utilize it. You can't get it and you're staring at it. Right. Yeah. Um, so when I started doing that, um, that's when I realized that if I want to go into an avenue like that with business, I need to make sure that we have extreme amounts of bulk, yeah. which got me into the idea of drop shipping. I came along with that idea because anyone who lives a normal practical life doesn't necessarily have 20 or $30,000 to throw at a wall and see if it sticks. Right. So I ran into the idea of drop shipping and the idea of being able to start a business and have absolutely no limits on volume yeah. that are not limiting you from making sales and stuff and you can focus entirely on your your page and your storefront and your ads and stuff and you can make sure that you're never going to run into that stock issue while you're starting up right um, seemed extremely appealing right because that is a huge headache that is probably if i had to chalk that business up to one thing that was extremely difficult it was having inventory right right so and that's what makes the drop shipping scene a little different from like the amazons or 
the um the etsy's like you said because you need scalability it's the worst thing in the world to have the audience but not have the product to deliver to them and it's i know really frustrating you, i know what you mean because the money is sitting there you just got to grab it but it's it's not attainable it's just out of your reach right. so that's why i encourage a lot of the people um who are like kind of just in a mix of oh i don't know what business to start right now there's no other business in the world like drop shipping that's going to allow you to start at a low cost, be efficient and have as much scalability because you're not holding any inventory, mm -hmm. right? And you can always make the adjustment. Like right now, you're going back to um, buying in bulk, you know, now that you have the systems down and in place, you have the audience there, you have the conversions, you have the metrics. Now you can always make the adjustment after you have the cash flow coming in to say, all right, I'm gonna start buying in bulk and you know, just make the processes better. And now you can actually afford it. You can, you know, you can buy $30,000 worth, $30, worth of product confidently knowing that it's going to sell rather than just trying to guess, you know, right out the gate. Exactly. So that, that's one of the things with um, drop shipping, man. I, cause, and I say that because a lot of people at first, they'll try to bash drop shipping or they're kind of skeptical about it, right? Because they're like, oh, products are coming from China. Why would people buy from China? They're not buying from China. They're buying from you, right? Yep. And you just happen to get the product from China for now. And yep. even right now, you're getting it for like six day shipping on average from China. During a pandemic. <laughs> During a pandemic. So it's not, it, it's not bad. Um, those are odds that I would like. As somebody that's just coming in, trying to start a profitable, profitable business with little or no money to start, this is probably the best business model I've seen in the last five years. And I'm still, um, I'm still sticking to that. And it's me? even, it's even better during the pandemic because I'm not sure um, what you've heard um, from John's side of things, but um, realistically speaking, I will tell you full heartedly that we started this business, our initial investment so far to date that yeah. was required was um, the, money for the domain, $15 US. Mm -hmm. That is the only money that we have put into this uh, business that stays in this business because normally without a pandemic, you've got your 14 days, you buy a domain, you could try and get as much going as possible in that time frame to see if it sticks. If yeah. it doesn't cancel, if it does pay for the month. Right now with that 90 day Shopify trial, you don't have to worry about any Shopify fees for 90 days. You get three months to play around yeah. for free. They are the doing other that. thing, the other thing a lot of people forget, um, because a lot of people get so stuck on the Facebook side of things, they don't even venture off into the Google world. And the thing about Google that's really nice is that when you put your credit card on the Shopify, a day later, they give you $125 of ad credit to go nuts with on Google for free. You put 25 in and they give you 125. What they don't tell you is that that 25 you put in originally gets taken away by that credit. So it's essentially free. You just, it's a hundred dollars for free. You put your card in, you spend that 25, they give you an additional hundred at that 150. You can pull out or the 125, yeah. sorry, you pull out, you have not spent a penny on Google and you've used all of that ads for free and yeah. you still haven't been charged by Shopify yet. So we still haven't been there. charged. And it goes to show like in the business world, this is just a partnership thing. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you're, if you're running a successful Shopify store, who every the supplier is going to benefit right you're going to benefit the systems and the processors that the advertiser is going to benefit shopify where you're hosting your store is going to benefit because you're creating a demand that's what makes this whole thing so valuable oh yeah and they take their cuts too right that's the thing everybody's helping out everybody yeah as long as you aren't a risk nobody's going to care right as long if you pose a potential risk that's when paypal and shopify are going to have something to say about it but as long as you're running a clean business with good intentions right. they will do whatever it takes right. um to do that they've helped us out a couple times i know that we switched um i we we because i live in canada um i personally have been taking the money in to place orders and such right obviously yeah. any major drop shipping store at least that advertises to the U S knows to use U S to create comfortability with the customer, right? They like to see right. price, what they're paying at the end of the day, right in front of them, not currency conversions or anything confusing. You want 
that checkout process to be as clean as possible. So we were doing it in US and we realized about three weeks in that when it would get converted from US to Canadian, it's an unfavorable rate, which is with every bank, right? They always want to, uh, I guess in the US, you guys don't deal with it as much, but in Canada, everything comes from the States. So we are so used to paying conversion, yeah. right? Yeah, and the banks good. normally, they'll, they'll tack on an extra three cents on the dollar for the conversion rate and make money that way. So when it would go from Shopify from US to Canadian, we'd get hit with conversion. It would come in again in Canadian which Shopify wow. takes their fee. And then when we'd buy product from AliExpress, it would get converted back into American all at an unfavorable rate. And just switching to a U.S. bank account and paying in U.S., we're saving on estimate 25 to 50 cents an order margin, right? Yeah. So it doesn't sound like much, but when we've done 300 orders in a month, it adds up pretty quick. You know, that's 150 roughly U.S. dollars that have just been thrown out the window, right? So... That could have been avoided otherwise. So exactly yeah, making a good move. Yep. Exactly. Little things like that, right? I've just we've really worked on touching those up and making those better to increase the margins. That way, when we get main product in, it's already set up, ready to go. It's a clean running ship, right? Right. Those are the optimizations. And exactly. And um, speaking of the optimizations, uh, tell me where you're at with like ads like how much how much are you spending on ads a day right now and how what's your goal revenue wise like how much are you making on on ads per day okay um so right now um the prices have been a little bit adjusted over the time period so anyone that hasn't used google ads um pretty much your really rough crash course on them is when you launch ads it continuously optimizes they use machine learning just like your facebook pixel does um, but it's entirely machine learning when it comes to shopping ads, which is what we have really focused our um, our effort on because they produce so well. Right. Um, so what happens is when you start, you want to use a higher bid to get enough traffic in to show Google, look, we're doing good. Um, we're getting sales, good click through rate, low bounce rate, no complaints. And Google will reward you based on a quality score that's hidden on shopping. Um, and the better your quality score is, the more your bid value. So it's essentially what you're bidding times your quality score equals your rank. Right. Um, and then it compares it to everybody else on the page. So what we do, which is uh, the strategy. Sorry, give me one second. Sorry about that. No, you good. Um, so what we use is a strategy that I've personally, I haven't seen it really online, but it's a strategy that I've utilized in a lot of uh, Google Ads startup stores is uh, you start your bid off high. And as you start getting more and more conversions and more and more data to give Google, yeah. you start scaling your ads backwards. And as your quality, you're using essentially that um, high cost per click to boost you, right? So you put it in the spotlight and it lets Google get all that information. And once it absorbs that information, you scale it back because your quality score stays. It's not based on how much you're bidding. Gotcha. So now, uh, so essentially now with that backstory here, when we were getting um, high volume, we were doing a dollar six Canadian uh, per click. And we were getting fantastic results. We would spend about uh, $250 a day in ads, yeah. uh, Canadian, for a return of every sale right now. We're making about 22 Canadian profit, and we were getting about um, 25 to 30 sales a day. Yeah. So it's uh, with that rough math, it's, it's a pretty good conversion. It's uh, probably about a row ads of three to three and a half, yeah. um, which isn't bad for drop shipping especially um, as I said earlier we use expensive shipping to make sure it gets to the customers quickly because we have plans for all of those customers later on uh, okay. without getting into too much detail on that we do in intend on keeping customers and reselling to the same base so we want to make sure that the customers are happy with their first experience and the shipping was fast they don't have any complaints on that matter that way we can dip back into those later and try and get some more money there yeah um, yeah so with those margins in mind, we still are doing um, like a three to three and a half row as average. Now that our quality score is so good because we've gotten so many conversions on there, uh, yep. we actually were getting too much volume uh, for our manufacturer to handle. And UPS is starting to get a little bit overloaded in the, uh, in the Chinese region. I know in America it goes great, but in yep. the Chinese region, they've told us multiple times that it, sometimes it takes two or three days at UPS before they tag it and start moving because of the volume they're taking in from 
drop shipping as well as just everybody ordering, right? Yeah. So we've scaled back. Um, I've scaled down the cost per click from 106 Canadian down to 68 cents Canadian. Wow. And uh, what I'll tell you is that um, right now our best day when we were at a dollar six Canadian, um, our best day was about two hundred and sixty dollars in ad spend to for a return revenue of fifteen fifteen hundred and thirty dollars American. Mm. Um, what I'll tell you now is that even though we've scaled it back, our quality score is so strong in relation to our competitors. That yeah. scaled that at 68 cents a click. Um, I think it was yesterday or the day before we did 1,480 in sales wow. with almost half of the cost of the original one because that quality score is paying such, yes. such work. And the thing is, is that we scaled this back. So most people that drop ship, they know to have a header and in the header, it says have a sale. You know what I mean? You want to have some kind of urgency up there which we utilized um, when we scaled back because we want to stop getting in so many orders to recuperate money. Mm -hmm. um, we actually don't even have a sales header and we still did that volume wow. without having any kind of sale or promotion on the website whatsoever, just because of that quality score. Uh, being yeah, so on the month, how, how much revenue are you at for the month right now? For the month, I will check the updated total for you right now. Give me one second here. So for the month from the first, it's now the 27th of May. This month we have 14,100 in revenue. Nice. Uh, nice. 282 orders. And how long you've been in business? Or how uh, long have you started running ads? Um, our ads, we've had a few hiccups with them, but we've officially got our first day of sales um, five weeks ago. That's crazy. Actually, no, four weeks ago. Sorry. It was the 25th of April, I believe. So basically in a month's time, done 1,400 or 14,000 and your, your margins are still looking good. And you, like you said, you have plans for these customers in the future. You're just getting started. Just set up like your Facebook pixel because you've been doing things off of Google. So this is really just the start of like something big. Yeah, this is just the tip of the spear right here. Right. We, we, with the marketing plan, I have a funnel that I've already written out in place that looks to be everything that I've projected so far has happened um, about three times faster than expected. Right. But I'm expecting within the next two months to have the funnel started where we expect to sell to the same customer base another one to two times minimum with no advertising. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, heavily based on why we've decided to spend more money on shipping and lower our margins right now. I remember when we originally started, I was talking to my partner, John there, and I told him as long as we break even or even take a little bit of a loss, five to 10% loss, it's okay because we're going to make pure margins for the next one to two sales off of those customers. Yeah. And I do estimate that each customer, as long as they had a positive experience, we have a 20 to 25% chance of getting them back with our funnel. Exactly. Um, so realistically speaking, the fact that we're making 30% margin drop shipping, 60% That's, margin when that we get already is in, crazy. Oh, exactly. Right. And then once we get that funnel going, get being able to sell another two or three times, we're estimating to make about a hundred dollars us per customer. And we've already in a month done over 300 customers. So yeah, realistically speaking, That's it's crazy, had a lot of potential for scale, it's right? Not even so. fourth quarter yet. You know, you have so much time and there's just like this whole, your whole store concept, it screams nothing but opportunity to me, man. So I'm sure it's going to be a lot of success in the future. Now, how is it, um, what have you taken from Econ Bootcamp, for example? Because you have access to Econ Bootcamp, right? I do, yes. Yeah. Um, so, so things that I've learned from the Econ Bootcamp that were um, very helpful isn't necessarily, obviously, you teach mostly Facebook on that, and I use Google, so a lot of people would think that none of that information is relevant, but that's not true. So yeah. a lot of the information that you take from that is, um, even your store setup, the way that you talk about um, consumer insight and consumer psychology, right? Being able to not only make a website and make a product page, but to sell to that customer, right? It mm -hmm. takes a good product page and a sale yes. to make 
to make that conversion, right? And if you just have the product page and you don't have any information to kind of drive that customer to buy, you won't make any money, right? So things like that, that you teach in that store layout and the way that everything looks clean, we used um, our homepage specifically actually is literally um, the exact theme that you include in the theme that you use. Our whole website is actually based around the theme that's provided to it. And we've done a lot of changes um, with the coding side because I'm fluent in HTML and CSS, but um, we actually have used your exact theme and we used on the homepage, your about us, that whole template that you include on that page. We actually use that exact template for about us and we've put that on the homepage and that the amount of people like before, I will tell you firsthand before we were looking through analytics at where we would drop customers because you can track all that. And before we started using that template for the about us and put it on the homepage, um, if they viewed our homepage, we almost lost them eight out of 10 times because we didn't really have anything there. Right. Especially with drop shipping, it can be hard to make a homepage, right? Because you don't have any of the products firsthand yet or anything like that. So we used your template. Um, ever since then, our drop rate on the homepage is less than 5% now. Wow. So something as simple as that, literally just using that text between just using that text, you've probably made us at least the cost of the course back just sure. off that text alone in the theme. That's so it. it's all about the, th- the thing is buying a course isn't about you're going to make us money. It's about you're giving us the tools so we can make ourselves money. Right. And that's all I say. It's like, look, I can't build the business for you. In fact, I haven't. I haven't. I just mm-hmm. given you the resources, right? And you pair that on top of your own action, your own knowledge, your own resourcefulness, and you've built the store. And now you have the information you need to make something convert and make sales. Exactly. And that's the thing. One little tidbit of information, depending on who it's in the hands of, it can make you a dollar or it could make you a hundred thousand dollars, right? It's all based on the insight, right? Of somebody that's done this and somebody that is currently doing this successfully, taking that insight and applying it to yourself and learning from it will send you a long way. Yeah. Yeah. That's dope, man. Congrats again, man. I appreciate it. Like even more than, I don't even talk about my numbers anymore because it's more about my students' numbers. Like I know that first sale is the best. You still haven't felt the same feeling from that first sale. Oh, I know. Right. It's crazy. I mean, the best sale. I remember me and John were literally screaming one day because I was hanging up uh, with Google ads. They have that startup time. So you normally don't see conversions for five to seven days. I remember we got the first one um, and I called John and I told him and he, he started screaming. I remember that. He's like, oh man, it works. That was so fast. And then we got another one. And now, now within four weeks, we're getting pissed off if we're not making 15 sales in a day. Right. And uh, four weeks ago, we were excited to get one in a day. You know, it's just, it's a crazy transition that really absorbs you, you know?